Welcome to another video from the Guards Museum and this time we'll be looking at something a bit different. Open a magazine or blog and chances are someone will be wearing a jacket, trousers or boots that look very similar to what I see around me every day in my museum. The features and colours of military clothing have become an everyday part of fashion as these stylish examples illustrate. And if you don't like the military connotations well you can just call it utility. In this video I'll be looking at the enduring influence of military clothing on the high street and exploring the military origins of a number of modern fashion garments. In the next video I'll look at how society and fashions have embraced military style and how some of our common items have forgotten military origins. Before going further I'd like to stress that as a curator I'm not a fashion expert. I won't be answering the fundamental question about what defines fashion or make something fashionable one day and not the next. You'll find plenty of other YouTubers who will do that for you. But during London Fashion Week last year I wondered what it was about military garments that took them from the barracks to the coat hangers of army surplus shops and ultimately the catwalks of the major fashion shows. Let's take a look at a classic example of high street military fashion, a field jacket from Next. We can identify the military features. Firstly, it's a classic olive green and made of a tough cotton weave. Then there's lots of useful pockets and compartments. It has big buttons for easy opening and closing. And there's even detail stitching to ape the strengthened areas on military clothing. And here it is seen alongside a khaki drill bush jacket worn by guardsmen in the Malayan emergency. The similarities are clear. I'll start with actual military clothing in civilian use, which first started to appear as surplus. Following the Second World War, huge stockpiles of clothing were sold off cheaply, and today the military regularly updates its clothing designs, camo patterns, or just sells off unserviceable or, or unneeded clothing in bulk. At one time every high street had an army surplus shop piled high with trousers, jackets and boots in various states of wear. It was the go-to place for kids wanting to play soldiers, students wanting to protest against war while wearing military garb, and outdoor types needing protection from the outdoors. It's cheap, hard-wearing and often serves a specific function such as being waterproof, windproof or having lots of pockets to carry things in. Farmers need warm clothing, the builders want pockets for their tools and festival goers need to stay dry especially during a British summer. Surplus also came from gentlemen's outfitters such as Mossbross who provided uniforms to the military and Silverman's, a large uniform store that opened in 1948. Some surplus shops such as the now closed Lawrence Corner in Euston gained a cult following and were a favourite of film wardrobe departments including the first Star Wars film. It was also there that designers found the musicians tunics that inspired the Beatles Sergeant Pepper uniforms. Modern military fashion crazes were inspired when military clothing suppliers sought to expand their market into civilians. Burberry had a lightweight waterproof overcoat which they marketed under various names but was soon known by its nickname, a trench coat. The British Army was looking for an overcoat to replace the rubberized coats and traditional great coats in use at the time. The problem with the rubberized products was their weight and stiffness, while the classic wool great coat was too heavy when wet and with mud clinging to it was a real hindrance to movement. Soldiers in the trenches were known to have to hack off bits in desperation with their bayonets. So a new specification called for a lighter and breathable material. Conveniently Thomas Burberry had invented just such a fabric called gabardine and designed a coat with a special military features such as epaulettes so that rank insignia could be added without piercing the waterproof layer and metal D loops for map cases to be hung off. A storm flak on the back extended round and buttoned over the top buttons on the right side to form what was called a gun flap. This prevented water from finding its way into the jacket when an arm was raised to fire. Since it was designed for British officers only and was a private purchase, the trench coat had a certain kudos about it from the very start. 
They were very popular in the First World War following major marketing campaigns by Burberry and Aquascutum. They received a style boost in the 1930s when Humphrey Bogart wore one in the films Maltese Falcon and Casablanca. They quickly became the uniform for detectives and reporters in Hollywood films. Women liked the ability to produce an instant hourglass figure just by tightening the belt with every follower of fashion knowing to tie it and not buckle it. The trench coat of today has stood the test of time for a hundred years and is clearly still recognisable as such, despite the passing fashions for longer or shorter length. They usually even retain the epaulets on the shoulder, which serve no function in everyday use, but they do look good. The 1950s US fishtail parka became the uniform for mods in the 1960s. Originally designed for soldiers as a warm overcoat with fur-lined hood, they were a godsend in the cold hills of Korea during the war there. When sold off, they were ideal for scooter riding or sitting in the coffee shops of Brighton alike. Perfect for protecting the mod's smart suits from the elements and a nice blank canvas to add all sorts of badges to. The Who's Quadrophenia album cover from 1973 and the later film reaffirmed the mod trend with Paul Weller also championing the Parker. Then of course Parkers made a comeback in the 90s with the Britpop boom and Oasis. Fashion houses cottoned on and the Parker was reinvented for the catwalk by the likes of John Paul Gaultier and Alexander McQueen while Kate Moss graced the cover of Vogue in a Parker. In the late 1970s, skinhead and punk cultures adopted the United States Air Force MA-1 bomber jacket. This nylon jacket was cropped high at the waist to allow for sitting in the cramped ejector seat, and the low collar was to avoid snagging on a parachute harness if the pilot had to bail out. Perhaps more usefully for the everyday wearer, it also had a zip-up utility pocket on the arm, which quickly became known as a cigarette pocket. Its shiny look and brighter colouring appeal to those seeking to differentiate themselves from the Harrington jacket trend. The MA1 enjoyed revivals in the 1980s when Steve McQueen wore one in his last film The Hunter and in 2013 when Kanye West co-opted its perceived far-right associations for his Yeezus tour. The duffel coat is another mass issue uniform item that arrived as surplus and then via the supplier the name comes from the town of Dufel in Belgium, which supplied the wool used to make thick hooded coats for the Royal Navy. They were worn at sea to keep out the cold, and uniquely shaped toggles enabled sailors to button them with cold hands. They were kept by many sailors after the war, and were widely available in the 1950s through the original supplier, Gloverall. They became student chic and also a mod alternative to the Parker. Still popular today, the fashion advice in recent years has been to wear them unbuttoned to avoid the look of Paddington Bear, who was recently reimagined in film. Two military surplus-inspired items in the 1980s school playground, as a younger me could confirm, were the snorkel parka and the woolly pullover. The N3B parka was a US military polyester parka with lots of pockets, a faux fur-lined hood and a lurid orange lining, originally designed to be seen from the air by rescuers. The hood could completely seal off the face, apart from a narrow aperture at the front to see and breathe through, and became nicknamed the snorkel. It was intended for Air Force personnel in extreme weather, and quickly became the cold weather coat of the US military. Copies became a staple of school kids in the UK and the US, chosen by parents who wanted something cheap that could take all the punishment a child could throw at it in the playground. Although they later became the butt of train spotter jokes, by the new millennium they were back in fashion thanks to the West Coast rappers who wore them because they stood out in the heat of LA and North West rock bands who needed to keep warm in the Arctic conditions. The original military manufacturers, Alpha, now offer a whole range of snorkel type parkers. The British Woolly Pulley technically known as Jersey Heavy Round Neck, evolved from a World War II commando jumper and like the parka was tough, comfortable and warm with cool shoulder and elbow patches and a penholder on the arm. It was what amounted to casual wear for the British Army 
and was worn on duty as well as around barracks. They were also quite stylish with a tighter fit all over and sleeves that rolled up neatly and they're still in use today. So there are some examples of military clothing now worn as fashion. Finally in this video, while we're looking at surplus and its influence, I'd like to say a bit about camouflage. It's safe to say that most people walking down a city street in green camo are not trying to keep a low profile. It's certainly one of the boldest fashion statements to wear as when worn out of context it clashes so much with everything around it. It's about taking something designed to blend in and hide you and using it to stand out. The type most common is the woodland camo scheme, classic brown and green mottled patterns. These were designed by the Western armies to fight in the countryside and wooded areas of Europe, principally against the Soviet Union. British DPM and American woodland camo typify this type. Other types evolved for jungle fighting in Vietnam. These have now been replaced by modern digital patterns designed to work in a variety of environments. But it's interesting to see that for fashion it's the older vintage styles that are still the mainstay. And I think it's probably because the clever modern patterns are just too good at blending in. Let's face it, that's not what the wearer wants. But what do I know? I deal with the history of those who do want their camo to hide them. So that's it for our look at surplus and military items that are now worn every day. In the next video I'll look at how society and fashions have embraced military style and how some of our common items had forgotten military origins. If you've enjoyed this video please give us a thumbs up and do subscribe to our channel where we'll be exploring history and delving into our collection in further videos. Thank you very much.